Hello animators! Today's topic is some of the stickier points of animation. These are the things that people tend to get a little bit hung up on and have trouble understanding the nuances of. So I expect that you have already learned your 12 principles of animation, your animation fundamentals, and if you haven't, um, I recommend that you go watch Alan Becker's video series on the 12 principles animation. It, they are great explanations of some of the vocabulary that we'll be using. We're gonna dig a little bit deeper into some of them in places where I've seen students kind of have a little bit of trouble grappling how they actually apply. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is timing and particularly timing and spacing because they go hand in hand. The timing of an animation really has to do with the number of frames or drawings that you need to make something happen. And frames being the common denominator of animation, usually you have a frame rate that is predetermined and it's a constant, right? So you have these drawings or these frames that are going by at a very particular rate. For example, 24 frames per second is, a, is one that you would come across in cinema. So if you know the constant frame rate, then you can always calculate how many drawings or frames that you're going to need to fill a certain amount of time. So in this example on the left, you have a time code. Um, so often in film, you'll see time written out in this fashion. On the far left is hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. So this number here represents one minute, 57 seconds, and 22 frames. Now, if you are working at 24 frames per second, then you can take this number and you can do some math, yes, math, and you can calculate how many frames or drawings you need to fill that one minute, 57 seconds and 22 frames. So pause the video for a moment and get out your calculators and see if you can figure that out. All right, so what's your answer? Does it match mine? 2,830 frames, um, right? So that's a lot of drawings to fit into not even two minutes of, of film, but th that's the way animation goes. Um, and so this is a useful little tool that you need to, to be able to do this type of math so you can calculate if somebody says, I want a two minute animation, well, how many drawings is that actually going to take? All right, so as I said, timing and spacing are related. If you have a constant frame rate, then the way that you control the speed of the animation is by varying the spacing between your drawings, like how far you move things across the page, or if you're moving objects, how much you move them. And there's a little mnemonic that I have to help me remember how this works. The shorter the space in between drawings, the slower something is going to move. The farther the, those drawings are spaced apart, the faster something's going to move. So if you look at this little illustration, each little mark on this line um, that these two bugs are racing towards the finish line, right? Each little mark represents one drawing, right? A separate piece of paper or a separate frame. And you can see the bug on the top, the little fly, their spacing is quite a bit farther apart than the spacing of the little bee on the bottom. And so farther, faster. So this fly on the top is going much faster. In fact, it's going twice as fast as the little bee on the bottom. The spacing down there is, is shorter, so the bee is going slower. Okay, so another uh, animation fundamental, one of the 12 principles that you will hear is slow out and slow in. Now this also is referred to as ease out and ease in or easing, sometimes it's called cushion. Generally, it's just referring to the fact that things don't suddenly come to a stop. They kind of slow down gradually or they speed up gradually. And if you look at the representation of the timing at the bottom along this little line, as a train is coming into the station, it's not coming and then suddenly it just like stops right there. It's getting, it kind of slows as it comes in, right? And that's represented 
by the spacing at the bottom. You can see it's constant spacing for the first one, two, three, four, five, six little tick marks. And then the spacing gets shorter, so it's starting to go slower each time, right? And as it goes to the station, it is slowing down. It's easing into the station. I just like to use the term easing because, you know, are you easing into the station? Are you easing out of the station? I mean, it gets a little bit confusing there. Uh, so I just say, you know, add some easing to that animation. And in fact, you should add easing to almost everything. Like if this is really just um, physics and it will make your animation just look a little more lifelike if you add a little bit of that cushion as something comes to a stop, as something starts going again. All right, so staging is another one of those 12 principles of animation. And uh, staging, you know, it's all about communication. It's all about getting the, um, the most information to the viewer in the shortest and most efficient way possible. So when I think about staging, I think about it in three different aspects, three parts of staging. One is where you place your characters, one is how you pose your characters, and one is how you time the action. So let's take these one at a time. So in this image on the left, we have Remy and he's very close to the camera and he's looking directly at us and it appears that he's talking to us, right? And if you just glance at this, you can get a lot of information in just sort of like a couple blinks of an eye, right? First of all, we see Remy, we see his posture looking directly at us, he's very close, but then we also see some of this stuff in the background. Um, we see the other character who I believe is his brother and the brother's holding something, which is uh, something that he's eating. And uh, we get a little bit of the ambiance of the atmosphere. But because the background is blurred out, that separates Remy from that other character. And Remy is, um, we are in his confidence, right? So he is telling us something directly. In the image on the right, here we have Remy and his brother talking to each other, right? And this is flat staging. They're both on the same plane. And um, we have very little in the background to distract us, uh, but we don't really have that whole depth of field separation like we do in the other shot. So we don't, it's not that sort of intimate relationship that we are having with Remy. It's more about Remy and his relationship with his brother and the conversation that's happening between us. So the idea is that in looking at these shots, immediately you get a sense of the relationship of the characters to each other, their relationship to us, without having to do a whole lot of mental work. One of the things that helps us understand those things is using cinematic language. So using different types of shots, like close-ups, medium shots, wide angles, um, extreme close-ups, Dutch angle, up shots, down shots, all of those things. Your choice of a camera angle really helps uh, communicate with the audience because we've been watching films and uh, TV all of our lives and we are sort of fluent in that cinematic language. So we can make assumptions based just on the type of camera angle that we see. For example, in this uh, image on the top, which is a Dutch angle image, the camera is a little bit tilted. Having that tilted camera immediately puts us a little bit on edge. It gives us a sense of anxiety. And so it's really great for, uh, you know, action sequences, um, for uh, shots where you want the audience to feel a little bit uh, on edge or scared. It's sort of like the world is a little bit off kilter. The shot on the bottom, which is a wide angle sort of establishing shot, is really all about the environment. It's about us taking in the different aspects of the environment and understanding their character's place in that environment. And so, again, it's all about what you can get in a very quick glance. Part two of staging is how you pose the characters. And this is where this idea of the silhouette test comes in. Certainly if you've um, studied the 12 principles of animation, this is one that's talked about a lot. So this is all about having the, the action or the um, attitude of your character immediately recognizable without all of the little details. So if we go back to this shot, we have you know the two characters in the, in the top image, the zombie and the little girl being chased. And if you look at their silhouette, 
Well, the zombie silhouette looks pretty zombie-ish, even without, you know, the weird expression on his face and the details of the ripped clothing. And the pose of this little girl, she's very clearly running, right? Her arms are spread. There's sort of that strong line of action that tells us those things. So to take another example, staging does come from the world of theater. And uh, the, the example on the left has that flat staging again, and the characters are in full profile. And, you know, I mean, this is, this is okay. This is probably naturally how we might talk to someone facing them one-on-one. -on -one. But uh, there's a slight problem with this, and I'm wondering if you can kind of figure it out. Compare the staging of the image on the left to the staging of the image on the right. What makes the one on the right clearer? If we apply the silhouette test to this, it becomes a little more obvious. On the left, you can see, well, the arms have completely disappeared. The hands look sort of like some alien coming out of the person's stomach. Um, and, you know, we just get this, this one kind of monopod look. Whereas when you have that sort of slightly cheated towards the audience three-quarter view on the image on the right, now we can see both hands clearly. We can see both legs clearly. We still get most of the profile of the head um, and the tail and, and such, but um, we just have a much better sense of the posture of the character. So one way to get those very strong, easy to read poses is to do a little exercise called pushing the pose. And that means that you sketch out your character the first time and you sketch them in the pose that shows the emotion. So in this case, this little girl is scared got sort of a scared theme going on in, uh, in this presentation. And, um, and then you take that drawing and you think, well, how can I exaggerate this more? So in the next pose, we've pushed the arms out a little bit. We've accentuated the curves, particularly of the line of action of the legs. We've, we've exaggerated the eyes and the expression a little bit. And then you might take it even further, see how far you can push it. Can you really exaggerate it until you know, it's almost gone too far, or maybe it has gone too far and you've completely lost the sense of the character or the sense of the emotion. At that point, that's when you kind of pull it back just a little bit and maybe you found a really good strong pose. Okay, so part three of staging is how you time the action. And this one has to do with actually moving things around. So I'm going to show you a little video that was made by a student of mine, Tori Van Dyne. I'm just going to pause here for a moment and go through this particular shot. So you'll see that the crab comes into the shot and then we have this very brief moment where we get a pause and then we have one helicopter comes in and then we have a second helicopter comes in. So note the helicopters don't both come in at the same time. And while the helicopter is coming in, the crab is sort of not doing very much. So it allows us to focus on the helicopters. Then once the helicopters are in and we've had a minute to just take that in, then the crab has its action, right? So it swipes at one and then it's going to swipe at the second one. And then again, a little pause and we get this great strong pose, right? Good silhouette, good staging here. And then the crab goes away. So in this shot, you're going to notice a little bit of nice back and forth that directs our eye from one side of the screen to the other. So as we open the shot, we're definitely over on the right side with the crab because it's so big and dominating. But the movement of the tank is bringing us over to the left. 
So we sort of go and we look at this tank and it comes in and it stops, right? And so as it stops, notice that the crab is just starting to move. And so we move our focus from the tank back over to the crab, right? And as the crab is moving, the tank aims upward um, and the crab sort of now they're kind of coming together in the same side of the screen. And this is a climactic moment, right? And so we have this big movement and that brings us back over to the right side. And notice that the tank, you know, it's got, it's lowering its gun barrel um, to just like, let us know it's alive over there while the, the crab is still. And then now the tank is being still and the crab is getting up and it is going off the screen. Okay, so our next topic that tends to confuse people a lot is these four different principles of animation, anticipation, follow through, overlapping action, and secondary action. So all of these principles circulate around a main action. Now, I wanna start with the anticipation because often I hear students identify anticipation by saying something like, well, you know, I hear this really scary music and the um, shading and color scheme in this shot is really dark and the character looks um, really scared. So we can anticipate that something bad is going to happen. And what I want to clarify is that when we talk about anticipation within the world of animation, we're not talking about a plot device. We're not talking about expectations or foreshadowing. We're talking about an actual action that the character is doing to prepare for another action. So you have a main action. In this case, it would be kicking a soccer ball. And you have a um, preparation for that action, right? Try kicking a soccer ball without drawing your leg back. It's totally impossible. So the act of pulling the leg back before you kick is the anticipation. Then there's the main action, actually connecting with the ball and kicking it. And then comes the follow through, which is the momentum carrying that leg forward as the ball is already off in the air. So anticipation is always paired with follow through and they bookend that main action. And so you, again, it's sort of like easing. You always want a little bit of anticipation. You always want a little bit of follow through. Now you can do really exaggerated anticipation and really exaggerated follow through. It just depends on the style you're going for. So here's this nice little bit of animation made by my student, Diana Towner. So if we break this down, we see that the anticipation goes in the opposite direction. Then there's the main action of the actual jump. And then the bear needs to catch its weight as it comes down. So it sort of overshoots its goal. Sometimes you'll hear the term overshoot. Okay, so what about overlapping action? What is that? That is all of the little things that sort of trail behind that main action. Again, we're thinking about the main action of the animation and what is attached to it. So this is closely related to follow through and sometimes you hear overlapping action and follow through being paired together, but I think it's more of its own thing. It's stuff like tails, hair, clothing, jewelry, flags flapping in the wind, that sort of thing. And uh, so the key to the overlapping action is that somehow it is attached to a main body that is driving the movement, but it is always a few frames behind. So there may be a path of action from the tip of the wand of this little girl, but the ribbon that's attached to it is following that same action, but it's following it a few frames behind. And then we get to secondary action. And this is really the creme de la creme of animation. It's the icing on the cake. It is the little bit of personality and flair that comes through by adding just a little extra bit of detail to the movement of a character. Uh, it's a great way to push the animation to the next level and make it interesting. Again, it is attached to the main action, so there's gonna be one bigger action that's happening, but then there's gonna be these little things 
on the side, like a little waggle of the hand or a little um, flare of the knee or the turn of the ankle that's going to happen during that main action. So here you can see three examples of animation. Um, one, the one on the left, has just the anticipation and a little bit of follow through. Then you can see that overlapping action in the main has been added. And then on the far right, you see not only is there the overlapping action on the main, but there is this extra little flare of the tail that just gives this character a little bit more um, pizzazz. So the last sticky point of animation that I want to cover, I'm actually going to cover in another video because you have to go pretty in depth and do a little bit of math to really understand it. And that has to do with this idea of frame rate, working on ones, twos, and threes, and how that affects the speed of your animation, how things actually look. So you can find a link to the next video uh, down in the description. And I invite you to put on your thinking caps and really dig into this because this is what sets apart the amateurs from the professionals.